Yeah. What, y'all can't understand me either? I, I mean, feel like I'm going through the drive-thru with this mask on. Let's all stand up and sing together. Mask free for at least a little bit. And uh, I hope that you will. I know we're spread out some and, and singing out, but I, let's lift our voices together. We have a great God to sing about. Sing with me. He is exalted. The King is exalted. All night. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise His name. He is the Lord, forever is who shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in here this morning. Appreciate you coming to worship. Hope you're excited to hear what God has for us today. I know things are a little weird, a little strange, but we know that uh, God can still speak to us in the midst of all that's going on. We're praying that he does just that this morning. If you're a guest, thankful to have you. Uh, make yourself at home. Please enjoy the service and just allow God to speak to you. That's really what we ask for our guests here this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ask him to bless us. Lord, we do thank you for the opportunity to gather, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to pray, to worship you by way of singing, to fellowship with other believers, and then in a moment to hear your word preached. And these are all things you command us to do, Lord, and all things we know that they, they please you and they bring you honor and they draw us closer to you. So help us to have that mindset. I pray that you help us to put aside the distractions and things, uh, the concerns of our heart, Lord, and really to focus on you. I pray that you will encourage those that need encouragement. I pray that you'll convict those that are away from you, Lord. And we pray for those in here that don't know you this morning. I pray that you will draw them to yourself, show them that you are true and that you are the way, the truth, and the life, Lord, and that you have the answers that we need in these times. 
I pray that you'll speak to each of us, draw us closer to yourself, and help us to glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Ensemble, for that great song. There's a lot of noise being made in the world today, some of it good, some of it bad, but one thing we should definitely exalt is the name of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful name it is. If anywhere it should be exalted, it's here in this church. Would you stand with me, sing the song, What a Beautiful Name It Is, the Name of Jesus. You are the word in the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven. Please be seated, and uh, I'm just going to throw out a quick reminder um, about uh, about our offering and how we're handling that, and then Brother Ed will come sing. But um, uh, let me remind you that we do have the, the box out there in the lobby. You can drop off your tithe and offering <clears throat> in that. You can continue to give through our church app. Um, also, the church website has a way that you can give online as well. So uh, we ask you to continue to be faithful, as you have been, um, with uh, worshiping the Lord through tithes and offerings. So we're going to pray now. We're going to ask the Lord to help us to focus on things that, that really matter in life, things that are spiritual, and ask the Lord to bless the preaching of the word. Father, we, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for the price that you paid on the cross. 
And then how you conquer death and hell by coming up out of the grave. We can't thank you enough. And I pray that we thank you with our lives, not just our prayers and our songs. And Lord, we want, we want to grow closer to you. We want to become stronger in our, in our faith and, and stronger in our devotion to you as a result of hearing the word preached. So I pray that you guide our pastor as he comes and as he preaches. I pray that you help us to be listening, not just to the preaching, but to the Holy Spirit's conviction. And Lord, as you uh, talk to us on the inside, I pray that you'd help us to be willing this morning to make any decisions that, uh, that you have asked us to make. So we pray that you bless our worship together now in Christ. And we pray. Amen. this blessed Thank you, Brother Ed. I'm thankful for the day that I got saved, aren't you? Where you trusted Christ as your Savior, and He changed, uh, he changed who you live for. Stop living for self and start living for Him. I'm thankful for that day. Let me say to our guests, we have several here this morning, thank you for coming and being here. I think Michelle brought her family, and I was honored with that. It made me smile. And uh, I look around, and, and, and I know that Pete has a, 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 some guests with him. Honored to have you. And then, didn't know John Johnson. Mark walks up on staff and says, oh, I forgot to tell you, my brother-in-law is going to be here today. Well, good to see you, John. He's pastor in, in Florida. And I usually, if I know he's here, have him come here at least address us. But he knows that we love him and appreciate he and Beth and what the Lord's doing there in Florida. And I honor any time a man of God comes to our church, even on vacation. And I know a lot of our folks are going on vacation, but I appreciate those that were here this morning. Good number this morning at 9 a.m. And good to see my B team. 
Yeah, those that sit on the B rows. And so uh, anyway, um, y'all were supposed to shout and applaud and stuff like that, but you, you didn't get the memo. Yeah, all right, thank you. And if you want to really applaud, it's Rose's birthday. She's 29 again. Let me, let me tell her, I can't. Uh, she said, don't forget us, I can't. Um, let me talk to you a little bit before we actually begin the message. Go ahead and turn to Matthew, or excuse me, Matthew, Mark chapter 13. We're back in our text where we, where we have been as we're preaching through uh, the Word of God. And things do change uh, to, a, to a very, very strong uh, as we look at the last really three days of the Lord's life now before he dies on Calvary. Very, very intimate time right here. Before we do, I want to talk to you a little bit, about, a little bit about church direction decisions. We're going to go forward and continue with what we're doing, guarding ourselves. You know, we bought the machine to, to, to spray and disinfect and what we do in between services. Y'all cooperated so well with, with the A, those that came in the A hour and the B hour and, uh, and coordinating the vestibule. We need to keep working in that regard. Uh, our greeters, and our, our, our guests, uh, or excuse me, our greeters and our ushers are, are wearing masks. We're trying to, to, to follow what, what the, the mandate is. Now, if you're in my shoes, and I know I've said this before, I want you to really understand this. Um, I have some that feel we haven't done enough. I have some that feel we've done way too much. Um, and, and I even have people not attending and in, in upset a little bit about decisions that are made. And I must say this to you, and I want you to hear me and hear me well. This should never be a dividing factor for Hilltop Church. We're not built upon uh, social or political uh, or, or, or even any of the other. We're built upon the Word of God. And uh, this is not something that, that should, should, you know, everybody has opinions and, and personal opinions. And I'm not, I know and I recognize that. And not, uh, you know, I have some myself. If you ask me privately, I've got a few opinions myself. How many know that already? You know, so, you know, here, here's the deal. Um, we're trying to do all we can to protect our people. Yet, and I want you to hear me well, God made us to worship. He made you to worship. And worship is more than just watching on television. I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for uh, the abilities we have to, to, to actually broadcast our services like we do. And I'm thankful for all those that in no way, shape, or form. There are people that, 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 that there are reasons for, Physically, they should not be here, and they should not be in public. Period. I understand that, and I don't. If you're at home watching, I know we have some. I'm not trying to, not trying to slam or make anybody feel. I'm not attacking anyone. God knows my heart. I'm not. But I am, I am telling you, we are creatures of worship. If we don't worship God, we'll worship something. Think on that a moment. It's a true statement. And I want to give you the opportunity to worship Him. Um. It's in our DNA, and I, don't, I mean that sincerely. It's in our DNA. It's who we are. I am. I want, when we get to phase three, and I'm, I'm, my goal is it be July 15th, and probably we'll have a midweek service again. Just a few more weeks, we'll have a midweek service. We'll start that first. Um, I want to give you the opportunity to, to come and, and worship, and we'll have our team ministry as well. Uh, when that day begins, I really want our teams coming back. We have one of the best team groups of any, any church I know. And uh, not them not being able to, to, to meet. Uh, truthfully, you don't meet, you scatter. And, and I worry a little bit. And I worry is a bad phrase, but I do. Um, so the 15th is the date that we're targeting for our midweek service. And then I have a special service on, on August the 9th. August the 9th, uh, I've asked Jim McComas. I said he's one of our dear friends. We love him. He's a great preacher. And he's coming out with a, a, his, his third album. And, uh, and so I want him to come preach Sunday morning with us. And uh, he didn't ask me, by the way. I ask him. I, I don't usually let singing groups come. He's not a singing group. He's a preacher who can sing. But um, I say I don't let. I just don't. It's not something I do a lot of. I, I want to build the church on the Word of God, not on not on concerts okay and so uh and so that's just me and that's in, it's in my dna <laughs> but but i am um, i asked him to come and spend all day sunday with us he'll preach both the a service at nine and the b service at ten thirty, and then sunday night he, he i asked him to sing several songs uh, about six or seven of them like a little mini concert uh, and i want it to be we're still gonna get a couple of his old ones but but i want i want some of his new ones there's one that he sings um, that, that, that really in the back of his mind is about his son uh, 
that died, that, that he's singing to me. And to be honest with you, I'm not an emotional guy, but I'm riding in a car and he's singing. And I'm and tears rolling down my face. And I'm like, man, you got to stop this. It's killing me. <laughs> but but um, he's going to sing for us that night at 630. Uh, and so uh, that'll be when we start our, our, our PM service. And then next week, uh, I know there are going to be some parents at home going to do backflips on this statement, but we'll start a children's ministry, and then we're working really hard to, to make sure that, that everything is clean, masks are worn, that we keep the children separated. I know there's a pandemic out there. I'm not, I'm not ignorant, but I just, I, I know that there's some parents that are like, praise the Lord, let's, let's, start, let's let our children, you know, and so that'll be, that'll be next Sunday at the 1030. Mark will say it all at the end, but I'm just trying to paint the picture for you that, that I'm ready for for the church to be the church and, uh, and for us to go forward worshiping him. And um, I, I don't want to be, I, I don't want to disregard any regulation, don't, don't want to, not some rebel without a cause, not what I'm trying to do at all. I just found a long for us to be together around God's word again. And that's, uh, we're doing it this morning and we'll, we'll do it more as the coming days. And now you at least get an idea of the direction of this pastor. I'm really, really wanting our children's ministries back in order because I'm very concerned about a generation coming behind us being taught the word of God. We have an excellent program for, for young people and I want that to be active again um, ASAP because of my concerns and I think anybody's concerns. All right, I said enough about that. If you haven't found Mark chapter 13 by now, God help you. <laughs> Because we've been, I'm kidding. Mark chapter 13, we're going to start reading in verse 1. And, uh, and I'll give you some context because I know we skipped last week to be able to preach a Father's Day message. But we're right back in the text. Let's stand and pay honor to God and his word. And uh, let's read this together. And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. Exclamation point. Stop, look at me. I know we're reading the text, but just look at me a minute. They're leaving. They're walking away. Let's pretend that the temple's behind them. They're walking away. And one of them turns back to look because I've been to Israel twice now. If you've never been, to be able to behold the ruins of the temple is unbelievable. Well, he's seeing it in all of its glory. And he's looking over it and he's saying, Jesus, this is awesome. Just, man, wow. I've just never seen a structure like this. And by the way, Hatton. So that's what happens in verse 1. Watch verse 2. And Jesus answering saith unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. In other words, it's going to be destroyed. And as, he sat, uh, and, he, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James, John and Andrew, two brothers, two sets of brothers, asked him privately, Tell us when these things shall be. And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, and we know this is the Olivet Discourse. Take heed lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying I am Christ and shall deceive many. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled for such things must needs be. But the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in diverse places. And there shall be famines and trouble. Stop on the word troubles. Uh, interestingly, we have two other accounts of, of, of this, both in Matthew uh, and, and also in Luke. Matthew is 24 and 25. And I'll tell you about it in a minute. But, but well, I'll tell you now so you can write it down. Luke chapter 21. Some of you love to take notes. I actually parallel this. I think it's interesting in Matthew, he doesn't use the word troubles. Matthew, quoting the same thing the Lord says, actually uses the word pestilence, which would be translated diseases for us. Now, not read it into, not trying to say what the Bible doesn't say, but I think it's interesting that that is what is stated as one of the signs of when the end actually begins. All right, then I'll, you know where I'm going. There are the be these are the beginning of of sorrows. Let's pray and ask God to help us as we understand his word. Now, Father, I love you today, and I thank you that I have, we have the opportunity to continue this study through the book of Mark, just a concise, really, story of, of, of the life of Jesus. And we thank you that you inspired it and that we get to read all four of the gospel narratives of what Jesus' life was on this earth. But, Father, none are, are, are as cut to the chase as the book of Mark. I pray that I rightly divide it. I pray that we have understanding. And when we leave here, we be ready to see you one day. In the name of Jesus, we beg it all. And amen. You may be seated. 
The Jews are extremely proud of the temple. Matter of fact, that would still be a statement true today. That's people travel from all over the world to see the very temple that we're talking about right now. Jews are very proud of it. But if you think they're proud now, you should have seen their pride in that day. It was, it was really nothing quite like it in the world, certainly in their world. Now, what's interesting about the temple, the temple that, that you see the ruins of today was actually um, built because of Herod. Herod was trying to win favor and placate the Jews and Herod actually helped finance the building. One of the reasons why uh, the, the temple was so innate and so beautiful and had so many of the extras to it is because Herod trying to win the confidence of the Jews actually helped to finance and create it. Now, I said that so I can make the next statement. Can you imagine now you, you realize there's not a building. We'll see more about that in a moment. Not a building like it in the whole world. The Jews are extremely proud. A lot of money has been spent to build it. And the Jews, the, the, the Jews which are in power, in particular, the scribes, those part of the Sanhedrin, really, those that were of the upper crust were running the goings on of the temple. And in comes Jesus. And Jesus actually pitches, and I'm going to use the correct, correct phrase, he pitches a, a righteous fit. And, 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 and so he he throws tables over. He, he runs money changers out. He has a whip, the Bible tells us. He runs them, and then he tells people that are walking in this temple square, this isn't just a passage through. This is God's place. You're supposed to honor it. This isn't a cut through. Go around, pay honor to God, but don't use this like, like it's nothing. He's absolutely changing things. Now, you're a scribe. You're in charge. Maybe you, you're in charge of the selling of the sacrifices or the money changing. Or, or maybe you're those at the, at the front not allowing people to go past a certain point toward the Holy of Holies. You're doing all that. And in comes this man. You have an idea or an understanding of why they came to him. There we know in the corridors around those, those temple, around the temple square saying, really the court of the Gentiles, saying, who gives you the right? Who gave you the authority to do this? That's what they're asking. And so they're very upset with Jesus. But remember, Jesus has quite a following. We studied, remember how they laid the palm branches and he comes in on the donkey, really fulfilling Zechariah chapter 9 that, he must, that the Messiah must enter Jerusalem on a donkey that's never been read. Jesus does all that. He comes in. There's a crowd that's impressed. Matter of fact, the Bible plainly says in Mark that the common people received him gladly. So he has a crowd. But, they are innate. They are frustrated. They are, they are in rage of why Jesus is doing this. And so they ask him, we'll just go over real quickly. They ask four questions. Three of them actually were just given to trap him. Just three questions where, you know, we pay Caesar, we pay this tax to Caesar, or, or, or what about the one about the, we've already covered all this, so I feel like I'm just kind of setting the, setting the stage, but remember the lady that married seven brothers, well, whose wife would she be in glory? All of those were just questions to trap him. There's one scribe there, and he's listening to all this. He's probably starting out against Jesus, but he has, uh, he has the people in front of him asking him questions. Jesus answers all of the questions masterfully, and he actually asks a legitimate question, remember? He actually believed. Matter of fact, we have every reason to believe that he was coming close to a believer because Jesus Christ himself said, you're not far from the kingdom of heaven. So his heart and his mind must have changed from the other scribes. Then Jesus, in response, he has four questions asked of him. In response, Jesus asked one question, and you know the question. We studied it. Nothing but from the Psalms, where he says, What about when David calls his great, great, great grandson Adoniah, which of course was the Messiah? And what he was saying is, Isn't there something different that King David would call his grandson God? If indeed the Messiah comes, he's going to be more than mere man. That's exactly what Jesus was saying. And he was really using the Psalms. They knew the Hebrew words. So they knew he was accurate in what he's saying. They could not argue with him. They would fail miserably. He's actually doing a great job of explaining that if he's the Messiah, he is not a mere man. He's a God man. And by the way, we believe in the hypostatic union. Fully God and fully man. That's Jesus Christ. So here we go. He answers them and, and they're beginning to, to bicker among themselves. You could almost hear them murmuring and talking, but the common people are listening. And Jesus then says, beware of the scribes. I love this passage. It's the most awesome passage. 
they wear this crowd right here. Can you imagine him doing that? They're there. It's not like he's saying it behind their back. They're right there. Beware of this crowd. They're all about themselves. They're all full of pride. And he goes on to explain why they're full of pride. Now, all this has taken place. So now we have the setting. He's leaving the temple. All this is, this is like most commentaries. Weir and Wearsby says it was the, the day after. Okay, so it's the next day. Really three days before he dies on Calvary. Keeping it in mind what we've been studying. We act like, I know it's taken us months to get to this point. But it wasn't months. We're studying for months what was one week of his life. Shake your head if you understand that. So he, he's leaving the temple. He's walking, he's walking out. And still those disciples and all this, they're just, you know they're staring at this, this absolutely beautiful building. And they say, Father, Jesus, Master, that's some building, isn't it? And Jesus says this building's coming down. That's the setting. You got it? Can you almost feel it now? Our, our Lord says what we call the unthinkable. They're marveling at the structure and he, he predicts its desolation and its destruction. And I've already told you, you can see this in Matthew 24, 25. You can see this in Luke 21. But our passage really does put things in perspective. Now, there is no question he's going to now teach us when the end is going to begin. That's why we, thus you have the title. Now, I'm going to say some things that, that I think you need to understand at least before I delve into what, uh, what is said about the beginning of the end. I, I remember my undergrad and, and, and I was at Southeastern studying and, and we, were, we, were, we were actually talking about the Gospels. I took a class on, on the Gospels. And I remember it mentioning that, that, that my professor mentioning to be careful anytime you start preaching prophetic passages. Make sure you have an understanding and be careful in what you say. Because there are people that just hang on anything that deals with prophecy. And, and, and I want to say what, I, what I've heard for years, which is a wonderful statement. We're going to talk about prophecy for a moment, okay? But I want to say, it is not the Bible passages that I don't understand that bother me. It's the passages I do understand that is not being implemented in my life that bothers me the most. Anybody like that now? And here's what, here's what I'm going to say to all those that, that, that just really get in gear about any time we preach on prophecy. And they want to talk about prophecy. And yet they know there are things that are plainly stated in the Word of God. They're not obeying. Obey them. The mysteries will take care of themselves. Obey what you know the Word of God says. We're going to delve into some mysteries. But understand, obey what you know the Word of God says. Period. Now. With that said and done, there are three things I want you to understand before we ever begin to interpret this. First thing, this passage does not mention the church or the rapture of the church. Read it. Read its parallels in 24 and 25. Read Luke chapter 17 for yourself, 21 for yourself. Now, I'm, I say that because your pastor is not into replacement theology. Now, here's what it is in case that's over your head. I know it probably is over a few of you. I do not believe every single passage to the Jew equals today passages to the church. I think that's one of the reasons why people misinterpret Romans chapter 9, for instance. They don't understand the difference. And I'm going to say to you, I am not a replacement theologian. I do not believe what's said to Israel is also said to the church. Although I do believe there's some things that parallel. But I do not believe everything said to Israel equals everything said to the church. I say that because this, this reference is talking about the beginning of the end of time. It is not even mentioning, mentioning the rapture of the church yet. Shake your head if you at least understand that. You don't see it here. A lot of people, when they, they preach on this passage, they talk about the rapture. It's not there. I do believe in the rapture. Make sure you're not asleep or you're at least getting it. All right, secondly, this prophecy and the prophecies that actually cover the nation of Israel has actually spanned 3,000 years now. A lot of prophecy fulfilled that spans 3,000 years. That's one of the reasons why I love when my professor said, be careful for all those who think they have all the answers about prophecy because they're really lying. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Look. I'm up here with seven years of education. I'm telling you, I don't have it all. I'm going to have an undergrad and have a graduate degree, and I don't have it all. 
I mean, I went to Bob Jones University Seminary, and I went to Southeastern undergrad, and took a lot of classes, and I'm telling you, I have more questions sometimes than I have answers. I'm going to try not to tell you I'm educated, because you can't tell otherwise. That is funny, isn't it? Third thing. As with any prophetic passage, we must be cautious. We must be cautious. All right, with those three things in mind, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you three statements. Number one, the prophecy right here in this passage. You can write, you say, I could write this outline. It's not that hard. I wrote down the prophecy because he gives a prophecy. I wrote down the problems because he lists six problems. And then I wrote down the promise because he gives a promise at the end that we need not or better not omit. Let's talk about it. Y'all ready? Y'all with me? All right, good. Number one, the pro- it's, it's a wee long. Don't worry. We'll be okay. We'll be okay. Number one, the prophecy. Go to, go to verse one and two again. And he went out of the temple, one of his disciples, and saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answering, saith unto him, Seeth thou these great buildings, there shall not be one or be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So, so here, we have, here we have the disciples walking out, and I've already stated this, so I'm restating it. And they're, and they're all probably admiring, and one opens his mouth. The Bible just says one opens his mouth and goes, and I'm just going to give you, the King James is so pretty, but let me get, wow, what a building, Lord. Wow. And by the way, I've seen the ruins of it, and I say, wow. But to actually see it in its day would have had to have been, wow. Now, I have this program I use to study by, it's called Logos. Logos will give you things to suggest reading, and so it automatically referred me back to the works of Josephus. Now, if you want to know who Josephus is, Josephus is probably the most renowned historian of the days of Christ. And so he would have quite an insight of what the temple would have looked like. Would you like to hear how Josephus describes the temple? Because in the description of the temple, he's pretty much on key. Let me give it to you. He's a little way to read and you're probably not going to read it for luxury's sake, you know. It's not going to be, but but I'm going to tell you, you ought to hear what he has to say. I'm going to give you just a portion of what he says about the temple. This is his works, writings of the days of Christ. Now, the outward face of the temple in its front wanted nothing that was likely to surprise men's minds or eyes. For it was covered all with plates of gold of great weight. And at the first rising of the sun, reflected back a very fiery splendor. Now watch this. And made those who forced themselves to look upon it to turn their eyes away just as they would have done at the sun's own rays. Now, I'm not done reading this quote, but let me help you. Josephus, a historian, is recording what it would look like at a distance to look at the temple. Now, Herod had helped finance this to where there was gold and there were stones. They were robbed and taken when, when Rome, the Romans came and destroyed it in 70 uh, AD. But, 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 but at that time, Josephus is looking at it. He's overwhelmed with what he sees. And he says, it looks so awesome that if you were to look at it, it would reflect the sun it would, where you could not keep looking at it. It'd be just like you're trying to look at the sun, which I just did looking at these lights, which will blind you for a while because I have a white spot right here after doing that. Shouldn't have done that. But he looks up and all of a sudden he's blinded by looking at the temple. You get an idea of how great it must have looked, but I'm not done. Let me keep reading. No, this is inspired. It's just a history book as it were, but watch it. But, the te- but this temple appeared to strangers when they were at a distance, like a mountain covered with snow. For, as to those parts of it which were not gilt, they were exceeding white. Of its stone, some of them were 45 cubits in length, five in height, and six in breadth. By the way, a cubit is more than, than a foot. It's 18 inches. And so here we're talking these, these great big stones. Now, he said, it like snow. Now, when we see the temple, it has a beige look down. In all of Jerusalem, they require you, if you build a building inside of Jerusalem, you, it has to have that, that limestone. It has like a beige look. But when it was first put there, it must have been mighty white looking, almost like a glow. And, and so I am amazed whenever I have driven to Jerusalem, whenever I've gone to Israel, I've done it twice now. There's just something about when you get there, and, and usually you're going to go about the side of the eastern gate when you come in. That road brings you there. And all of a sudden you're looking for it because you know everybody's talking. It's, it's close. We're close. And it'll tell you by advertisements how close you are. Then all of a sudden you see the temple and you go, wow, I'm doing it now and it's destroyed. Imagine then. I'm not trying to beef it up. I'm just telling you what they said. 
The temple was something to behold. It must have been an impressive thing to look at. And, and so when Herod allowed them to, the work began in 18 BC. And, and, and let me give you a phrase. It would dom- a phrase we would understand. It would dominate Jerusalem's skyline. And, and so the disciples, they're, they're speaking of the stones in the building. And they're talking about it. Let me help you see what they're describing. The stones, this is our measurements. The stones were 40 feet long, 15 feet high. In 15 feet wide. Don't let that bore you. Think about that. They didn't have mechanical equipment like we have. They brought in stones, big old stones that were 40 feet long, 15 feet in depth and width. width. Can you imagine them building the temple out of these massive pieces of stone? What it would look like in that day. You know they were impressed. The doors and even some of the floors were covered with gold. Can you imagine? They wanted a picture of what heaven would be like. And they felt as though they had it in the temple. Do you now, and I said all that so I can stop and say this. Do you now see a little bit of why the Jews were so proud of their temple? Have I at least painted the picture where you go, yeah, I can see it. And so here they're admiring everything I just described. That would have been there in their day. They're admiring it and Jesus says, it's coming down. It's coming down soon. By the way, little commercial, free of charge. Time out, right? Ready? Tribulation, they're going to build another one. Oh, by the way, there'll be animal sacrifice again. But the temple I'm looking forward to is that millennial reign of Christ. Amen. L- let me help you. I've been, and if you talk to guides, they'll tell you they have everything they need for the Holy Holies right now. They're ready for the rebuilding of the temple right now. You can go online and read about it, and it's not mystery. They will tell you, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. The Jews are harvesting, putting together, and having things that will go in the new temple. Now, I know the Muslims have a a, a building on top of the Temple Mount right now, but I promise you it's not going to stay there. I promise you that. promise you. So first we see, really, the prophecy. Beautiful temple is coming down. But secondly, I want you to see the problems. Go with me now to verse 3 and 4. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew. So two brothers that are on the inside with Jesus. Now they come to get close. Matter of fact, I don't think there's anybody closer to Jesus than Peter, James, and John. That was his inner circle. The only one added to this was, was Andrew, who was the brother of John. So they come and they, they ask Jesus, tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? And so Jesus takes them to the Mount of Olives. Let me, let me show you a picture of what, what would have been round about. That's Rose and I were just right of the Mount of Olives, right there. You see the eastern gate that's behind us. And, and I'm going to just give you just something that, that I'm going to go out on a limb and tell you. I doubt that pole was there when Jesus was walking there, all right? I just have a feeling that power pole was not there. How many would agree with me on that? You probably think the pole was not there. But, but now look, the temple's been destroyed, okay? There, there, there's a Muslim temple dome you see in the, in the distance right now there. And, and it has a beige look. But I want you to think about for a moment that this being where Mount Moriah is, that being the Holy of Holies. I want, it's been destroyed, but that being the Holy of Holies. I want you to think about what's beyond those walls all being crystal clear and having gold and stones in it because they were robbed when Rome came and destroyed it. And so I want you to imagine for just a moment just how magnificent that would have been. It's magnificent now. Can you imagine? Jesus says it's coming down. They're standing 100 feet above it looking at it. Peter and Andrew and James and John want to know when, logical question, when. And Jesus gives us revelation. Mark chapter 13, now go to 5, verse 5. You got to keep your Bibles open when I preach. Because my opinion's not inspired, but God's word is. Amen. Let's read it. And Jesus answered them and began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ." And shall deceive many. And when ye hear, and when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, that's the second sign. Be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be. But the end shall not be yet. Watch for the third. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be, here's fourth, earthquakes in diverse places. And there shall be, watch number five, famines, and then troubles. Six. Six signs before the Lord starts the beginning of the end. 
Six signs. Let's talk about them for a moment. Let's go over them and let's see uh, about the signs of the times, what the Lord is describing right here. There will be false messiahs. Well, did you know, immediately after the establishment of the church, there were people claiming to be the Messiah after Jesus Christ? Now, the establishment of the church is in Acts chapter 2. We know it as Pentecost, remember? That's when the church was established. That, that's when God verified the workings of the Holy Spirit. Remember, the veil's been rent from top to bottom. The Holy of Holies doesn't, they, they go on carrying on in the temple, but God's not there. Can you imagine having church and God not be there? They're on with their temple, but there is no God rent from top to bottom. Jesus Christ has fulfilled all they've been waiting for, and now the Holy Spirit abides in men's heart. Different day. We call it the church age. Shake your head if you understand that. Different day. The church age. Well, that happens. All that happens in Acts chapter 2. I want you to read with me Acts chapter 5. Interesting. Verse 36. For before these days rose up uh, Thetis, uh, Thetis, excuse me, boasted himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, watch this, about 400 joined themselves who were slain in all. As many as disobeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. So here we have the first one. People are following him. He claims to be, be the Messiah. Acts chapter 5. Three chapters removed from the beginning of the church. Watch this. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him. So here comes a man claiming to be a Messiah. He's a liar. Over 400 people lose their life following him. In comes another man. He's Judas of Galilee and he draws away many of the people who also perished. Now interestingly, historically, just talking about the history of the church, one does not have to meander very long before they're going to find this statement to be true. Through our history, there have been many people that have claimed to be the Messiah. Through the history of civilization. If you've studied the history of civ, I know it's boring, but you're going to find there are people that claim to be the Messiah. Let me give you a couple. There's Moses of Crete. He claimed that, that he could actually part the Mediterranean Sea. He would do it to prove he was the Messiah. Obviously, he failed. There's another that came behind him in the 1100s. There was a man named Moses Adari, and, and he told his followers to sell all they had because when Passover happens in 1127, 1127, when Passover happens, the Lord's coming back and all of the world's going to be ending. And they did it. You say, well, preacher, that's crazy. That didn't happen in our day. Really? Really? Well, let's give you a few names. You ever heard of this guy named Joseph Smith? He self-proclaimed himself to be what? A Messiah. You ever heard this name? Charles Russell? You ever heard the name Mary Becky, Becker Baker Eddy? You ever heard the name Sun Young Moon? Guess what they all have in common? They all claim to be the Messiah. Jesus tells us in our day before he, before he begins to end it all. There'll be people coming and claiming to be the Messiah. I think that one's been fulfilled. Let me give you another one. There'll be wars and rumors of wars. How much time do you want to spend on that? The Bible tells us, and by the way, since the beginning of, of what we would call recorded history, Will Durant in his book says 3,421 3, years of recorded history, there's only been 268 years. Out of 3,421 years, there's only been 268 years where there has been peace on this earth. Think about that. There's been a war. By the way, there's children in this building that's never seen a day that America wasn't at war. They've never seen a day. Think about that. Wars and rumors of wars. The Bible says there'll be global upheaval. There'll be nation against nation. How, how many is watching the news and, and you try to not watch it now because it's more discouraging? Most of our problems will go away if we spend 30 days without any newscast. But anyway, that's good preaching right there. It, not, not in the Bible, but it's, it's good preaching. <laughs> that's a little, you get a little Jeffology in, in my sermon occasionally. That's Jeffology. But, but here we have the USA against Russia, remember? They laughed about it one presidential election. That they're the, Now they're all of a sudden the worst enemy ever known to man. USA against Russia. And if you hadn't picked up, we have USA against China. Well, guess what? Russia, China, and USA, we all have atomic bombs. And believe you me, I can see the stage set for a World War III. Not trying to be a, a hate monger, not trying to scare people. I'm just saying to you, it's the world we live in. 
Bible says that be kingdom against kingdom. Hear this. You know what that means? That's a way of thinking, a kingdom. We have, we have, we're living a day right now where we have democracy against, against communism. And, and then we have people in our country that don't like democracy. They want socialism. And socialism is communism light. You understand? But, but we, we, we're kingdom against kingdom. That's a philosophy of being against philosophy of being. If you do not see it, my goodness, there's been an apocalyptic feel ever since we've had COVID-19. You know that to be true. And I don't believe it's so far-fetched. The Bible says there'll be an increase in earthquakes. You're going to laugh at me. We live in such a day, Google, just Google it, you know. Did you know, Brother Rick, there's earthquake.com. <laughs> there really is a site. Some of you are Googling it right now. I know how people think. Earthquake.com. Let me read you what it says on earthquake.com. Worldwide, there are around 1,400 earthquakes each day. 500,000 each year. 275 of these can actually be felt. The largest earthquake ever recorded was the magnitude of 9.5 in Chile on May 22nd, 1960. The world's deadliest recorded earthquake happened in 1556 in central China, killing an estimated 830,000 people. But in our lifetime, what we know, 2010, earthquake in Haiti, remember? Some of you remember that one. 2011, earthquake in Japan. Very, very fresh on most of our minds is the 2015 Nepal earthquake, which quite a few died. There's an increase in earthquakes. And according to earthquake today, we're experiencing oodles of them daily. They don't always shake what's on the earth, but it's being recorded. And some of them actually do. The Bible says there'll be an increase in frequency and intensity of earthquakes. Then the Bible says there'll be famines. The fifth evidence, there'll be famines. And I know, I know, you and I know, we know very little about this in America. I know you're, you're thinking, but, but look, I've traveled to quite a few countries and preached. I've preached in, in particular to India about nine times now. I've preached in, in Kenya several times. I've gone and I've watched where I have seen, I've, I've mentioned it in the first hour, I'll say it again, Jonathan can back me up on this. Some of the cities where you'll go into where there's like millions of people living upon each, on top of each other, it is not uncommon to see naked children running around in the streets with their bellies poked out. And their bellies are not poked out because they're full, their bellies are poked out because they're hungry. It actually works that way. And I've watched little hineys, and I'm trying to be funny, little hineys with big bellies out, and you know what's going on. It's called malnutrition. Or famine. You know, we, can, we, we think a famine is the pandemic happens and we couldn't find, we like to make hamburgers out of 80 20 hamburger meat. Eat a little bit of fat, but not a lot. You know, you feel better about yourself, but just fat gives a little flavor. Come on, talk to me. So 80 20, what a kind, 85 15 we'll take two. And we couldn't find any. So I go to Costco and they have some and people are waiting in line to, to get it. And I got me and I think it was Travis Moots, a, 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 a package of 80-20 hamburger meat, which is perfect for those burgers I mentioned already. That's a famine to us. We don't get the meat we want when we want it. But just because America is not experiencing that doesn't mean this world is not experiencing it. It is. The last one is trouble on every kind. And, and if, you, if you follow along with Matthew, it would be pestilence, diseases. And can I just say to you, I think there's a reason there's an apocalyptic feel. And it might very well be. It could be we, should be, we could be seeing the beginning to the end. Now, I'm, I'm going to back up. I'm going to say this before I say anything else. I'm not up here stating, this, bless God, this is it, seven years. I don't know. I don't know. And the preacher that tells you that, he don't know either. Okay. He can incite a crowd maybe and he can get it all on the edge of your seat. You don't know. We have to look for the signs of the times. In this sermon, I'm telling you, I see some signs. Fair enough? I see some signs. Don't say what I didn't say. But you see the signs too, don't you? Jesus listed six of them and you really have to be about blind not to see them. So what do we end with? The promise. Here's the promise. Jesus says, when you see this, this is just the beginning. And he compares it to a woman going into labor. I use this this first hour. I'll use it again. I got an email or, excuse me, a text from Raul and Brittany 
a couple, young couple in our church, and they were telling me that she was going into labor, you know, and that's exciting, and that's just the beginning, because there's some tough times coming when, you, when that labor starts. Come on, lady, say amen. April's over here going, I'm ready right now. <laughs> yeah, it's just the beginning. But there's some pain coming out before you get to hold that baby, right? It's going to hurt. I'm not trying to be. And can I tell you, before the end begins, there's going to be some pain in this world. It's going to hurt. But Jesus tells his people to not worry. I'm going to read a few verses to you because I think sometimes we act like this world's going to hell in a handbasket and out of control. And I'm telling you, there's somebody that has control of this. It's hard to use bad English. There's somebody that got some control. But it's a true statement nonetheless. Jesus has his sovereignty over this world. And he says, let not your heart be troubled, John 14. Or he says in Acts chapter 1, verse 9, and when, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, watch this, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, say that with me, this same Jesus, you failed that test, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him Go into heaven. Let me help you again. First Thessalonians chapter 4. You say you're reading a lot of Bible. I believe the Bible has the answer to man's problems. I think our problem is we're not reading enough Bible. First Thessalonians says, uh, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, I hope I'm in that number, then we, because it might hurt to die, what, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We ought to be reading this to say, hey, God's got this. Let me read another verse. I'm having fun doing this. I hope you're listening. The other verse is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 and 52. Read it with me. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be what? changed. Woo! Glory! Say amen, somebody! Amen. He's got this! And we act like he does it. I'm telling you what you need to know. Here's what you need to know. Do I know him? Because all of this we're talking about, you can worry all day long. If you don't know him, you better worry. But if you do know him, you don't need to worry. And by the way, I'm not talking about knowing about him. The devil knows about him, but he better worry. I'm not trying to placate to a crowd. I'm simply saying to you, do you know Jesus as your Savior? Let me help you even more so you'll really know what I mean. Was there ever a day, was there ever a day you said, I am a sinner in need of a Savior? Was there ever a day you said, I'm going to have to pay for my sins? But I found out that Jesus loved me so much, but God demonstrated his love toward us while we're yet sinners. He died for us. He loved me so much. He died for me. Amen. And I said, you know what? I could pay for my sin, eternal separation from God, or I could embrace and hold on to and depend upon what Jesus Christ did on Calvary. And sometimes we hear that and we go, yeah, I heard it before. Man, if you don't understand that, you're not saved. Well, see, I prayed a prayer. Show me one place in the Bible where I prayed a prayer and he automatically was saved. It's not a magic bean. Who are you holding on to for salvation? Jesus Christ. I'm afraid a lot of people have had religious experiences but are not saved. Do you have Jesus? I mean, do you have him? Because the most important thing you can ever do is embrace Jesus Christ. And here's what I'm asking you. Really simple. I mean, I've used this illustration through the years. I mean, you've heard me so much. You know what I'm fixing to do. I'm walking the way I want to walk, living the way I want to live. I'm confronted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I realize that I am that sinner. And that sin has condemned me. And I turn my back. That's repentance. I turn my back on the past. And I look to Jesus Christ. I'm not perfect. I might veer to the left. I might veer to the right a little bit. But my life's direction is embracing Jesus Christ. I just explained to you what salvation is. If that didn't happen to you, you didn't get saved. You didn't get saved. That's strong, isn't it? What are you holding on to? I believe the end is coming. I mean, I know that's a true statement. The end's coming. Ultimately, it's going to be a day 
This is all settled. And when that day comes, the most important thing is, are you embracing Jesus Christ? Are you holding on to him? I want you to bow your head and close your eyes for a moment.